What was Dublin like in the early 20th century? A second city of the British Empire. Dublin was also the first city of nationalist Ireland, and within its boundaries, the divisions of class and culture were extraordinary. This was a city of genuine diversity, its many complexities defying easy explanation. Rich and poor, immigrant and native, nationalist and unionist, Catholic, Protestant, Jew and Quaker, and so many more were all bound together in life of the city of Dublin. As the center for British rule in Ireland for eight centuries, Dublin was the focal point of the substance and symbols of British culture. Dublin was moving into a decade of remarkable change. Little would remain untouched. First, the 1913 lockout redefined the nature of commerce and class relations in the city. Then, in power in Dublin slowly shifted from the Protestant ascendancy to the emerging Catholic elite. At the heart of the city stood the huge stone fort called Dublin Castle, constructed following a 13th century decision of King John. The castle was the center of British rule in Ireland. The Irish sought self-rule for their republic and a separation from British authority. There were regular concerts in Liberty Hall where all could meet under apparently innocent cover. Beneath the surface, out of sight, was the other side of the city, the poverty, the grinding awful poverty. Slums filled to overflowing with people without hope dying in greater numbers than perhaps any other capital in the British Empire. Starvation, disease, and death were rampant. These misfortunates could not enjoy the theater, the opera, the concert. Their only pleasure, perhaps, a cigarette or a drink on Sunday. The sounds of war were far away, but they were beginning to echo here as those who wished for change sensed an opportunity. But Ireland was pregnant with anticipation. Soon she would be delivered of her child, and a terrible beauty would be born. Monday, April 24th, 11 a.m. Members of the Irish Volunteers are seen gathering in uniform at Blackhall Place. 11.15 a.m. Large numbers of volunteers begin gathering at Liberty Hall. They are joined by members of the Irish Citizens Army. Volunteer activity is also observed around St. Stephen's Green. 11.45 a.m. Members of the Irish Citizens Army take control of St. Stephen's Green and volunteers have entered the South Dublin Union. Nearby, volunteers also take control of the Four Courts. Noon, Monday, April 24th, a British ammunition convoy is ambushed near the Four Courts. 12.30 p.m., the British response begins. Colonel Cowan orders six reserve cavalry to send a patrol to Sackville Street, and for the three battalions of the Dublin garrison to send men to defend Dublin Castle. He also contacts the Kara by phone and asks that the mobile columns of the 3rd Reserve Cavalry are sent to Dublin. Tuesday, April 25th, 8.30 a.m. Under heavy fire, the Citizens Army forces at St. Stephen's Green make the decision to abandon their exposed positions in the Green and take up new positions in the Royal College of Surgeons. 26, 8 a.m. The news that martial law has been proclaimed by the British authorities is announced. 
Thursday, April 27th, 5 a.m. British troops begin using improvised armored cars to move men and materials more safely around Dublin. 10.30 a.m. The fire at the Irish Times building spreads quickly and British troops are able to move forward under the cover of smoke. Friday, April 28th, 1 a.m. Fire is out of control at Sackville Street and the Dublin Fire Brigade is stood down due to danger of small arms fire in the area. Saturday, April 29, 6.30 a.m. Heavy fighting on North King Street as the British try and take the remaining buildings. Some rebel positions have been abandoned, but more soldiers are killed and wounded when they attempt to take Riley's Fort. Sunday, April 30th, 10 p.m. The rebellion in Dublin is over. The fighting decimated large parts of central Dublin and will take years to rebuild. In all, 447 people have been killed, including 252 civilians, and 2,500 are wounded. 64 rebels have died, along with 16 policemen and 116 British soldiers. Thank you for that field coverage and war report. Our brave men and women capturing photographs and films from the battlefield. I would like to take this time to pay honor and tribute to the men and women who may have lost their lives in this event. They fought valiantly for their rights and way of life. Let's take a closer look at the damage and destruction. These buildings are completely destroyed. Many are simply gone. A shell of what they once were. A few walls still stand, yet the rest of the structure has disappeared. The rubble consists of small pieces of brick that have fallen and gathered into smooth mounds. We see that the streets are clear of rubble, and perhaps the citizens first cleared the streets after martial law was lifted. Due to the nature of explosions, we would expect to see debris and rubble everywhere. It is reported in the official narrative that the weapons used were rifles, machine guns, hand grenades, handheld artillery, and the forces of fire. After the event, the two sides agreed to peace for Dublin and began to rebuild the city. The citizens picked up the pieces of their lives and went forward. The remaining damaged buildings were skillfully brought to the ground by the Dublin Fire Brigade with the use of explosives and brute force. They took their orders from the men in top hats. Were the conventional weapons of World War I capable of such destruction? Or did some other force or weapon destroy Dublin? Another theory that I'd like to cover in this presentation is, was there some type of flammable propellant used that caused the burning of brick, steel, and stone? In the previous section of the War Reporter, we heard an account of buildings engulfed in flames with heavy smoke. Having the fire brigade at this event is something that we're going to take a closer look at. It's in regards to what happened in Dublin and what happened to other cities all across the face of the earth. On one hand, it does make sense for the safety of the fire brigade members not to fight a fire that's in the middle of an active war zone. However, I theorize that fire brigades could have played a larger role at these types of events. Let's recap what we've discussed, then move into a closer look at the men, the soldiers, and the fire brigade, including their equipment and their military training. According to the official narrative, in 1916, Dublin, Ireland experienced a week-long battle inside the city between the Irish and the British. This took place while World War I was in full swing hundreds of miles away on mainland Europe. 
Many of the Irish and British soldiers were allies as they fought together against the Kaiser in Germany. The finest military weaponry went with them as British and Irish war assets were deployed in a distant war theater. The men and women that were reported to have done this damage were from reserve units, and reinforcements were called in from far away. As we can see from this B-roll footage, artillery brigades consist of many soldiers, many horses, and the heavy guns. In order to bring artillery to the battle, the brigade had to travel long and far, off the beaten path, to get into position. The members of the Irish Army and their volunteers would want to target these incoming British artillery brigades. Irish snipers could wreak havoc on the British forces. In 1916, artillery was reported to be the biggest guns around. Other conventional weapons reported to have been used include hand grenades, baseball-sized explosives that were thrown by the hand grenadiers at the enemy. Rifles and machine guns were also used by many of the participants. Were the conventional weapons of World War I capable of such destruction? Or did some other force or weapon destroy Dublin? In this section, we're going to take a look at the fire and the original fire brigades. Aside from the weapons, fire played a role in the destruction of Dublin and other Old World cities. Let's take a look at the definition of brigade. A brigade is defined as a large body of troops with a tactical and administrative unit composed of a headquarters, one or more units of infantry, or armor and supporting units. It is also defined as a group of people organized for special activity. This is rare footage of the Great Vancouver Fire of 1904. We can see how intense the fires can be. We also see the fire brigade in action during the event and afterwards. Can a conventional fire burn down buildings made of steel, brick and stone? Or would a propellant need to be applied to achieve more destructive results? These buildings are fully engulfed in flames with the contents inside providing the fuel. Or was there an accelerant applied to the building either before or during the event? We can faintly make out something being sprayed out of the hoses. We typically assume that's water. Could they be spraying fuel onto the fire? As we've established, the members of the fire brigade were well-trained military men with expertise in explosives and weaponry. Could these events be military exercises? We've looked into the role of the fire brigade at these types of events. In this section, we'll consider other weapons taken from the historical record.
What's going on here in this photograph? This is very suspicious. The fire brigade member in the upper right. Men huddled around a smoking box in the middle of the debris. Is this some type of weapon that they're using? Is this part of the destructive force? What caused all of this destruction? Are we looking at the results of a weapon or technology that isn't known to the general public? What are we looking at? Where are the flame marks? Should black burn marks be present? Throughout history, we see many similar events. Numerous old world cities have been destroyed by fire, war, or other forces. This appears to be a repeating script with similar actors and similar equipment. For example, Boston, Massachusetts reportedly burned down in 1872. We can theorize that there is a concerted effort to destroy the old world city by city, building by building. Whoever is controlling these events has the resources to carry out this destruction all across the face of the earth, decade after decade, century after century. By using the cover story of war, or fire, or natural events, the control mechanism that's in place is systematically causing the destruction of the old world ways and the old world architecture. What other weapons can we examine from the historical record? We see some examples of sound cannons, reportedly able to cause a direct shock wave. It is reported that farmers have used this technology to shoot a shock wave into approaching storm clouds, which dissipates the likelihood of hail. Here's a photograph of reported aerial listening equipment, capable of detecting incoming aircraft. Could this be converted into a directed sound weapon by focusing sound waves onto a target? Another weapon for examination is electromagnetic technology. Electromagnetic technology is available for view in the historical record. Coil cannons which propel a projectile with the use of magnets and an electrical charge. Apparently, you can assemble these cannons in all shapes and sizes. Reportedly, this farmer here assembled one in his barn. During World War II, we began to see these weapons portrayed on a larger scale. In the article, we read that miniature earthquakes can be produced from the magnetic field around this weapon. Going even further back in the historical record, we see depictions of fasche technology, which is a bundle of metallic rods reportedly capable of directed electrical discharge. Fasche weapons were revered and celebrated showing us that they knew whoever owned this technology was in control of the power. The next weapon technology that we're going to take a look at is Archimedes' death ray. Archimedes' death ray technology is shown in this alchemical era depiction. The characters have devices that can harness and amplify the sun's power. We see the sun rays being collected and reflected onto a ship near the shore, causing it to burst into flames. Back in the day, one way to protect your castle from enemy ships was to put a giant reflector on the roof to gather the sun rays and redirect them onto the attacking ships.
some might say that this technology is fantasy, make-believe, that it never really existed, that all the many depictions from different artists are all from their imaginations. However, this technology deserves further investigation. To recap on the Archimedes death ray technology, it appears to have been a common weapon depicted in the old world. Perhaps this has been hidden away from the general public. Now we move on to Greek fire. In this one I'm going to connect back with the fire brigade, especially the similarity in equipment and materials. In the historical record we read and see depictions of Greek fire in action. It is reported that the fire stuck to whatever it hit and that water didn't put it out. It actually burned underwater. I'd like to reiterate that I'm simply theorizing here. I can't prove any of this. I'm just reviewing the historical record and asking why so many old world cities have been destroyed and I'm trying to find the answers to those questions. Could this type of weapon or technology have been used by early fire brigades to bring down specific buildings? In this depiction, is this person starting the building on fire, or are they putting out the fire? Hard to say. The individuals in the fire brigade were well-trained military soldiers. They were well-versed in explosives, weapons, fire, and fire control. Being a part of the military, they knew how to be highly organized and how to follow orders. In this final depiction, we see how advanced they were in the old world. The architecture, the ships, the craftsmanship, and the weaponry on deck. These tanks appear to be metallic. They remind me of the apparatuses of the old fire brigades. Look at the similarity. Could there be something other than just water inside those tanks? If there is a connection between the fire brigade and the destruction of the old world, I can only hope they evacuated all individuals before they brought the buildings down. If these were good men, they certainly spared the lives of the inhabitants that lived and worked in these structures. Were these men simply taking orders from their evil supervisors? It is sad and spooky to watch the buildings burning, knowing how it affected the lives of the men and women and the boys and girls in the area. Does your city have a story of a fire or a war or a natural event destroying the old world architecture? <laughs>